So during college, I went through this phase. It started out with dreams. I would dream that the rapture had happened, that several of my friends and family had been taken up, and here I was wandering down on earth alone. Night after night after night. I don't know what that says about my psyche, for the record. Then one Sunday, I woke up in a house full of college kids who had probably been drinking and talking politics until two in the morning, because that's what you did in a house full of hippies. I walked around bleary-eyed and no one was in sight. Not Megan, not any one of the two dozen people that could have been in the house that morning. Even the kitchen, always the hub of social activity, was empty. And somehow, in my sleep-deprived state, I decided that the rapture had come and taken everyone but me. I don't know how that happened. I don't even believe in the rapture in the way that some biblical literalists do. And I have to be honest, if the rapture did come as it's commonly understood, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have taken up any of us in that house. Not that anyone there would have minded. At any rate, our gospel reading today talks about a clear rapture. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken, and one will be left. Lately, when people talk about the rapture, it's when Jesus appears at the end of the world to beam us all up, well, all the good Christians, and then the rest of us get stuck down here fighting the devil, who's sometimes portrayed as a giant red-horned demon, and other times portrayed as the government wanting to slip microchips in your skin. Seriously, Google raptureready.com, it's some interesting stuff. But what does our gospel mean for those of us who don't believe in a rapture? Or at least don't believe in a rapture that looks like that. Since we often take much of the rest of the Bible as metaphor, and Jesus is really fond of parables or stories that represent the kingdom of God, maybe we should look at this rapture story as metaphor. As I see it, there are two main things we hear over and over in this passage. First, Jesus is coming. Second, we will be busy with our lives when he comes. We might be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, which is to say, enjoying ourselves. Or we might be grinding meal together, working. A lot of times these other things, eating, marrying, working, are seen as distracting us from waiting for Jesus' coming. But God made us as creatures that need food to live and feel the call to marry, and we need to work to support ourselves. It's a reality. So what if that's the point? What if the, that is what we are supposed to be doing? The end of this passage says we can't know what time Jesus will come, and later passages in Matthew stress that we shouldn't even try. What if instead we're supposed to be eating and marrying and working? Jesus, in fact, put a pretty high premium on these things. Jesus certainly values eating and drinking. We have a sacrament for that. Possibly one of the most memorable things Jesus did was break bread and pour the wine. It's such a powerful moment that reenacting that Passover feast is one of the few things most Christian churches agree on. What about marrying? Well, Jesus never did get married, but his first miracle was at a wedding. He turned water into wine to help the wedding hosts save face. Other miracles he performed involve raising people from the dead, casting out demons, giving sight to the blind. And then there's this wedding, this wine at this wedding. We have a God who puts marriage and wine on the same playing field as healing lepers. Cool. And working, well, Jesus got into trouble more than once for working on the Sabbath. Healing people on the Sabbath, well, okay. We could kind of get behind that. Even very strict interpreters of the law might justify healing people on the Sabbath. But he also picks fruit on the Sabbath. 
that is so far off the beaten path as far as Sabbath laws go. Having lived in a neighborhood with plenty of Orthodox Jews, I can tell you that even leaving the house without a wall was considered work. Different things can be justified to save a life. Okay, sure, you know, you can get in an ambulance if you're dying on the Sabbath. That's allowed. But there's no argument to be made for wandering through the fig trees for your lunch. So I don't think Jesus views eating, marrying, and working negatively. Perhaps the whole point is that they're involved in something. Have you ever been so engrossed in something, so engrossed in working or playing your favorite sport or enjoying the sunset on the beach? Sometimes we even describe that all-encompassing, larger-than-self feeling as enraptured. Dr. Sharon Heller, a psychologist and author of Too Loud, Too Bright, Too Fast, Too Tight, describes this from a more secular standpoint. Blessed are those who believe in something larger than self to give meaning to life and lower blood pressure. For some it is God, for others nature, for others the creation of something we throw our whole being into, a poem, a song, a dance, a painting. Whatever gets you to transcend self and merge with a larger entity, pursue it with a vengeance. I think that's what God's trying to say here. Find a way to be enraptured. Find a way to connect with God. How do you get there? I don't know. I can tell you some ways I get there. Being totally encompassed in singing hymns, working with kids, or a beautiful sunset can get me enraptured. Just getting engrossed won't do, though, if you're getting engrossed in a way that won't get you to God. For example, in my other life, I'm a trainee therapist. A few days ago, I had two clients right in a row who were serious dangers either to themselves or others. I'd never had any like that before, let alone two. I think I handled it fairly well in the moment, but afterwards, when I was driving home, I completely freaked out. I was totally obsessed about what I'd done and whether it had gone all right. And then, of course, I see the flashing lights in my rearview mirror, and of course I look down and I'm speeding. I'd been too wrapped up in my own internal crisis to even notice what speed I was going. I now have my second ticket in two months because I've done that twice now. I'm not, if I'm not even present enough to notice what speed I'm going, clearly I'm engrossed in all the wrong ways. I think the message of this passage is that while we're waiting for God, we're supposed to be doing everything else in our life. Our world doesn't get put on hold because Christ is coming. There are still people in crisis. The pre-Christmas rush doesn't stop because Advent is here and Christmas is coming. The important part is that we do what we were going to do to the glory of God. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted, or Beethoven composed music, or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. Find what you need to turn the daily into the divine. Make the mundane parts of your life odes to God's glory. This isn't an epic battle at the end times. It should be so easy. We don't need to spend every moment looking over our shoulders to see if Jesus is coming. It's much more menial and much more important at the same time. 
find a way to live as many moments as possible working towards fulfilling your potential in Christ. Good luck.